Welcome to our discussion of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And as the name might imply, this is a very important, dare I say, fundamental uh, concept in calculus. Namely because it uh, establishes a connection between the two major branches of calculus. That's differential calculus, where you're taking derivatives, and integral calculus, where you're taking a bunch of integrals. The fundamental theorem of calculus basically shows us that those two operations are inverse operations of each other. They undo each other. And this gives us the precise inverse relationship between those two. So the first part of the fundamental theorem deals with functions defined by an equation of the form number one here. So we have some function g of x that is defined by taking a definite integral of another function f of t. Right? Because if we're integrating from a to x, that's a definite integral. So f is going to be a continuous function. It's going to be continuous on the interval a to b x is going to be some variable, right, some value that varies between a and b. And then we can observe that g, the g of x function, is a g of x function because it de depends solely on x, which here is just the upper limit of our integral. Now if x was a fixed number, like 3 or 7 or 2 or a half or whatever, then this definite integral would give us a definite number. But because we let x vary, we're going to get different amounts of area under this f of t function. And therefore, the g function is going to get different answers, right, depending on x, and it becomes a function. You pick a different x, it computes an area, and it spits out a number, and that's g of x. You pick a different x find the area under the curve between a and x, that gives you a new number, that's your other g of x, right? So you can see how it, it becomes a function. A picture might help. So we're going to assume f is a positive function. Now it doesn't have to be a positive function for any of these theories to work. But by making it a positive function, it's much easier for us to intuitively see what's happening by just looking at pictures. So if f happens to be this positive function, right? See, so the blue line here represents the positive function, f of t. Then g of x can be just interpreted very simply as the area under the curve, under this f curve, from a to x. Here's my shaded area. And the g function is going to be this area. So you can see that if x were over here, right, we'd have less area and we'd have a different output for g. And then as x moves, we get different areas, right? Adding more and more area as we go. So we can think of g as the area so far function, right? It's how much area we have under the f function when we start from a and go out to some point x. And if we let that point x vary back and forth, right? We're going to get different amounts of area and therefore we're going to get different outputs to this g function. Let's look at an example. If f is this function here, and g is going to def be defined as we normally define it, as going from a to x, in this case a is going to be 0, then we can find the values of g of 0, g of 1, all the way up to g of 5, and then we can sketch a rough graph of what this area function will be, right, this output function. Well, first we notice that g of 0 equals 0, because we're basically finding the area under the f function from 0 to 0. And no matter what the function looks like, if you start at 0 and end at 0, you're not going to have any area under it. So it's not because the function itself here started at, at 0, 0 that makes this answer 0. It's because we have no area when we have no width, right? We go from 0 to 0, no width, so it doesn't matter what the height is, we would have an area of 0.
Now, if we zoom in and take a look at the function over here in figure three and just look at the part that goes from zero to one, right? So from down here, going from zero to one, we can see that creates a nice little triangle. It's a triangle of base one, height two. So it's very clear that the integral from zero to one, which is the area under the curve from zero to one, is just one half base times height, which is one. And that gives us what g of one is, right? So g of zero is zero, g of one is one. So far, coincidental that they equal each other. Okay, to find g of two, we can just add the g1 to the area of the rectangle, right? If we're going from zero to two, we just have this triangular piece plus this rectangular piece. And the rectangular piece has a base of one and a height of two, so that has an area of two. So we can add this one, the one, right, to the one by two rectangle, and we get an area of three. And basically what we did is we just did this integral as a two-piece integral. Remember we have the rules that says if we go from A to B we can go A to some spot in between A and B and then go from that spot to B. Alright, so now we have G of 2 equals 3. Aha, finally the, the pattern has been broken, right? It's not a 2. The answer is actually 3 this time. Alright, what about the next space? Well, the next space is now a curved shape and we can't really find that area really well um, with just basic geometry. It's not really a, a triangle but we could use some Riemann sums and things like that if we had uh, an equation for uh, this function but we don't really have that so instead we're just going to get a rough approximate we're going to figure out that it's about 1.3 so we're going to go with 1.3 and we're going to say now the area for the whole thing is 3 plus that gives you 4.3. And then we can continue this process. This piece down here looks awfully similar, similar to that piece, so we're going to say it's about the same amount. It's another 1.3, but remember this is negative area, so we subtract it. Now we're back to 3. Finally, the last one, this piece here looks like it's about the same, maybe a little bit bigger, so we're going to go with another negative 1.3, subtract that from 3, now we have a total area of 1.7. If we graphed all of those dots, right, all those different areas, so at 1 we had 1, at 2 we had 2, remember, at 3 we were up here at 4.3, right, at 4 we were back down to 3 and at 5 we were back down to 1.7 and then we connect those dots with a smooth curve and we get the area under the curve function so this is an approximate shape of what this G function would be and it kinda makes sense you'll notice that because in this interval from 0 to 3 the F function is positive the G function increases from 0 to 3 and then because we start adding negative area from that point on the function starts to decrease so we can see a good strong tie between those two functions alright let's take um, a side note here and uh, do a quick proof that we're going to need for the next uh, piece of the fundamental theorem of calculus and that is if we take our function, so in, their, uh, in the previous slides we had our blue function, right, our f of t was this blue function here. Well now my blue function is just going to be the simple function t or the simple function x, right, y equals x. So there's my, my function y equals x, it's a straight line, 45 degree. And if we take a to be 0, then we can find out that the g function, the area under the curve from 0 to x, right, and so, so from, instead of a to x, we go from 0 to x, of this function t is always just going to be the area of a triangle and it ends up being x squared over 2. Now let's see where that comes from. We can uh, derive this very easily. We know that the area from a to b of this x dx right this is the the straight line y equals x is equal to 
the area from 0 to B minus the area from 0 to A. And I kind of color coded here, right? If we're trying to find the area from A to B, that's all this stuff in green, then we have to take the area from 0 to B, which is all of the stuff that's green and red. You can see this is double shaded, minus just the area from 0 to A, which is the red stuff. Right? So simply we're just saying if we want the area of this shape, we can take the whole big shape, subtract the little shape from it. Well, it should be pretty easy to see that the area of the red shape, right? So we can do this in red. The area of the red shape, 0 to A of x dx, is simply just 1 half base times height, because it's a nice right triangle which is one half, the length of this base is a, and what's the height going to be? Well, remember, since this is the function y equals x, if we're over here at, this is, let's say, a is 3, then aren't we up here at 3, right? So it's a again, a times a, which equals one half a squared. Okay, well, what about the other piece? Sorry, let me move that down so it's out of the way. How about the other piece? from 0 to b of x dx. Well, you'll see very clearly that that's also a triangle, base times height. But in this case, the base is from 0 to b, so that's a distance of b. And again, because this is the line y equals x, the height is also b. And we get 1 half b squared. So now, by simple substitution, if we're trying to find this area in between A and B, it's just the green stuff, right, minus the red stuff, and we get that it's one half B squared minus one half A squared, these are twos, which is one half b squared minus a squared, or you can think of it as b squared minus a squared all over two. So now that's the general form. If we now want to find the area under this curve from zero out to some x, then we can see if we generalize right here, if we went from a to b, it ended up being b squared minus a squared. So by substitution, very simply, if we're going from 0 to x, it just becomes x squared minus 0 squared all over 2, which is x squared over 2. Ta-da! Okay, so we can see that the area from 0 to x of this simple function t is going to be x squared over 2. Well, with that in mind, now that we know that from the previous proof, you might notice that the derivative of g, right, g prime, is equal to x. Right, because if, uh, if g of x equals x squared over 2, then doesn't g prime of x just equal x, right? The 2 comes down, the 2's cancel, and you get x. And that x is really just the same function f, but with a different variable, right? The original function f was t, but t is the same thing as x, right? y equals t, y equals x. It's the same thing, just based on if your, your uh, horizontal axis is the x-axis or the t-axis. So in other words, if g is defined as the integral of f, then g turns out to be an antiderivative of f, at least in this case, in the simple case where the function is just y equals x. If we sketch the derivative of the function g that we found, and we show that in figure 4 below by estimating the slopes of the tangents, we get a graph like that of f in figure 2. So here is, from our previous example, 
the area under the curve right of this function right so if we took the blue function calculated the area under the curve plotted all those dots connected those dots we got the g function well now take the derivative of the g function start calculating slopes of tangent lines right positive slopes more and more positive more and more positive and then look at this it's a straight line so whatever that slope is it's going to be constant right so here's the slopes they're getting more and more positive then they level off because we get that constant slope right here and then the slopes of the tangent lines are starting to curl back over they're getting uh, more shallow right they're getting closer and closer to horizontal until we finally get to this point right here where it's zero so they're coming down right the slopes the values of the slopes are getting less and less until they hit zero right here at three and then now we're starting to get negative slopes right more and more negative and then less and less negative more and more negative less and less negative until we get to this point right here where it looks like the slope is pretty much horizontal back to zero so can you see here that the blue function represents the derivative of the g function so we might assume that this thing that we discovered with our simple function y equals x might also hold for this other function that we have all right to see why this might be generally true for all functions let's consider any continuous function f that is greater than or equal to zero so again we're just going to consider these functions that are positive they're above the x-axis just makes it easier for us to visualize what's going on okay then the g function is going to be defined as the area under that curve from a to x just like we normally define these these integrals so it can be interpreted as the area under the graph from a to x that we can see in figure one now in order to compute the derivative of this g function from the definition of a derivative right using the g of x plus h minus g of x all over h and take the limit as h goes to zero right if we want to use that definition then we have to observe that for h greater than zero right for so for a, a little h bigger than zero then g of x plus h minus g of x is obtained by subtracting areas look at figure five g of x plus h would be all of the area up to and including that bar and then g of x would be just this area to the left of it and so here's g of x in red g of x plus h is the whole thing and if you take g of x plus h minus g of x from it can you see that you're just left with that rectangle so it's the area under the graph from x to x plus h all right well for a very small h you can see from the figure that this area is approximately equal to the area of the rectangle right? it's not perfect right we want the area under the under the curve but if we let this h right this change in x be really really small then that error that amount there that's you know overestimating gets really really small and they're pretty close to the same thing and so g of x plus h minus g of x which remember is supposed to be just the area under the curve is pretty darn close to the area of the entire rectangle and the area of the entire, re entire rectangle is the width of the rectangle times the height of the rectangle the width of the rectangle is just h right because this is x plus h minus x this little distance here is h and then the height of the rectangle is just going to be f of x we're going to use the left hand endpoint this time so we can see that if we then take this expression on the left and divide it by h and then do the same thing on the right we get this expression is pretty darn similar to just the function evaluated at x right f of x so intuitively we can expect that the derivative of our area function which equals the limit of this as h goes to zero is actually going to equal that right because the only reason why these things aren't equal 
is because h here had some distance, right? And so you had some error. But as you take the limit as h goes to 0, that error goes away, and the squiggly equals becomes an actual equals. So we've now seen the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, part 1. And this is true even if f is not positive. We just use those positive versions to help us kind of visualize it. So if f is just a continuous function on some close interval, it doesn't have to be continuous everywhere. We can just look at it over an interval where it is continuous. So if f is continuous on some interval from a to b, then the function g that we're going to define, we're going to define this function g to just be the area under the f curve from a to x where a is less than or equal to x, x is less than or equal to b. That just means that we're looking at the area from a out to x, right, where we're on this interval from a to b. If we define g to be that, then g is continuous on that interval a, b, and differentiable on the open interval a, b, and the derivative of g is equal to f. So if we're defining g to be the area under the curve, then the derivative of that function ends up being the curve itself. And remember, the area under the curve is just the integral of that function. So if we use differential notation that we're used to, it basically says d dx of the integral from a to x of this f of t dt function just ends up equaling f of x whenever f is continuous. Or, roughly speaking, what this really says is that if we first integrate our function f, right, so we're taking the integral of the f function from a to x, and then we take the derivative of that result, we get back to the original function. So we, we take an integral, then we take a derivative, we get back to the original function. Can you see how those are inverses? Right? It's like taking a square of a square root, or a square root of a square. So with that in mind, let's see if we can find the derivative of this simple function. Remember, we're taking the derivative of g. The g function is defined as the integral from 0 to x of the square root of 1 plus t squared dt. But since that is a continuous function, we know the fundamental theorem of calculus holds, and therefore, if we take the derivative of g, we're just going to get back to that original function, and it's going to be the square root of 1 plus x squared. You can see that it's the same function, only now it's just in terms of x. Okay, you might be thinking that defining a function in terms of an integral just seems kind of stupid. It seems like a, a lot of extra crap that we have to do. Why not just define it a different way? Well. It may seem odd, and it may seem like a lot of extra stuff, but a lot of functions, physics, chemistry, statistics, and things like that, are defined this way. A lot of things are defined as integrals of other functions. One particular instance is the Fresnel function, s, which is defined as the integral from 0 to x of sine of pi t squared over 2 dt. It's named after the French physicist who came up with it. And he did a lot of work in optics. And this function first appeared in his theory of the diffraction of light waves, but more recently has been applied to the design of highways, strangely enough. Well, part one of the fundamental theorem tells us how to differentiate the Fresnel function, because if we're differentiating right, this, this weird thing, then basically right the integral just goes away and we just get that function in terms of x so the derivative of the fresnel f uh, function is just sine of pi x squared over 2 this means that we can apply all the methods of differential calculus to this s function to be able to figure things out you know when's it increasing when's it decreasing um, when's it concave up when's it concave down and all those types of things well, the figure below shows the graphs of the f function, just the sine function, and then the Fresnel function. Right? So the Fresnel function is the red one, and then the blue function is the f function. And remember, the blue function is the derivative of the red function. And you can see that the derivative equals 0 right here, and that's where the slope of the tangent line would be horizontal. 
it also equals zero here. You'll notice that the derivative is positive wherever the function is increasing, right? Gets to here, then the function starts to decrease, which gives us a negative derivative. Comes back to zero, right? Zero, and then it starts to increase again, positive, and then it levels off and starts to dip again, negative. Right? So you can see that those do actually work as one being the derivative of the other. Now we had to use a computer to compute the values of that integral because uh, it's not an easy thing to, to deal with. But if you zoom out, you can see a larger part of the graph of S, right? And even without that, even without using the computer to do all this stuff, you can see that it looks as if S is in fact the area under the graph of F. Can you see how if we start calculating the area under this from 0 to 1, it looks like about a half. So that looks like about a height of a half. Then we get out here, that's pretty close to 1, right? Because that kind of looks like a triangle from 0 to 1, which is a half. That's a little shorter, so that's not quite out at 2. And the height up here is still less than 1, right? Then we start adding negative area, so it's coming down in positive area it's coming back up so you can see that it does seem to work if we now start with the graph of s and think about what its derivative should look like it seems pretty reasonable that the derivative of s is f and we already discussed this we can see where it's increasing and decreasing and things like that so we kind of have a visual confirmation of part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus well the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus which follows very simply from the first part, just provides us with a much simpler method for evaluating our integrals because it tells us if f is a continuous function on this closed interval, then the integral from a to b of this function is just equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a, where the capital F function is just an antiderivative of the little f function. In other words, if you took the derivative of the capital F, you would get the little f. So it gets kind of confusing with the symbols that they use, but just recognize that the big F just means it's an antiderivative of little f, right? So if you differentiate big F, you get little f. And that's what we've been kind of saying. It's just slightly different. In fact, if we put it all together, you can see where the differences lie. So again, we have to suppose that f is a continuous function. All this only works on these continuous functions on this interval a to b. If we define a new function g to be the area under this f function from a to x, and we let x change and change and change, right? we get this new function, this g function, then the derivative of that g function is just going to be f. In other words, if we integrate a function f, then take its derivative, we get back to f. Another way of saying, looking at this is if we integrate from a to b some function f, it's equal to f of b minus f of a, where f is any antiderivative of f, that is f prime equals little f, right? In other words, this says that if we take a function and then take its derivative and then integrate we get back to where we started, right? Think of it this way. If f is integrated and then the result is differentiated, we, we come back to the original function. That's what we've already talked about. This one is saying that if we take a function f and then differentiate it, remember little f equals the derivative of big F. So really just by substitution we're just saying if we're integrating F prime, right? So if we start with big F now, take its derivative, which gives us S F prime, then take its integral, we get back to the F function, only we get back to the a difference of these two F functions. So we start with the capital F function, we first differentiate it, then we integrate that result, we arrive back at the original f function, but in the form f evaluated at b minus f evaluated at a. So taken together, 
the two parts of the fundamental theorem of calculus say that differentiation and integration are inverse processes or more specifically each one undoes what the other one does right they undo each other so just like squaring undoes square roots and square roots undoes squaring differentiation undoes integration and integration undoes differentiation they're basically just inverses of each other and that is the aha moment of the fundamental theorem of calculus.